the uh, online series on behalf of the Educational Board of the MIGA uh, Medical Association and the Egyptian uh, Society of Anesthesiology. Uh, I would like to welcome the speakers, moderators, and attendees to this creative and prestigious continuous opportunity to deliver not only an up-to-date curriculum in the field of anesthesiology, critical care medicine, and pain, um, but also to gather unique speakers and moderators from all over the globe. This opportunity is and will remain a great and successful experience in the current and the future virtual learning, especially evolved during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our first moderator today uh, is Dr. Yasser Reda. Uh, he is currently working as a senior consultant of anesthesia and is the lead of regional anesthesia and intervention pain management at Hamad Medical Corporation, Qatar. He is also a course director of ultrasound guided regional anesthesia and pain interventions. He studied anesthesia and chronic pain management at National Cancer Institute, Cairo University, Egypt, and awarded as Doctor of Anesthesia and Pain Management in 2001. He has a lot of qualifications, uh, namely Arab Board of Anesthesia and Intensive Care from Cairo, Egypt, European Diploma uh, of Anesthesia and European Diploma of Regional Anesthesia, European Diploma of Pain Medicine, and has a certification of intervention pain um, uh, sonography from the states. He has a fellowship of intervention pain practice from the states, and he ha he has Azra pain musculoskeletal ultrasound certification from the states as well. He also has ozone therapy diploma and has an American board of headache. He published many papers in the field of regional anesthesia and pain medicine, and he is a speaker and faculty in many local and international conferences and workshops in regional anesthesia, chronic pain and difficult airway workshops. Uh, Dr. Yasser, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, for the uh, presentation. It is an honor to me to be between my uh, uh, colleague, my student, and my professor. I learn every time. I'm just happy to be in this platform. Whatever I am a student or a speaker or moderator is the same for me. But today, I'm just presenting the, uh, one of the professional people and he gave a lot for the field of anesthesia all over the globe. Uh, Prof. Doyle <coughs> uh, is a professor emeritus of anesthesiology at Cleveland Clinic, Clinic Learner, colleague of medicine of Case Western Reserve University. And they have a very uh, well-known figure in the um, community of anesthesia. And he received his MD degree in 1982 and his BH degree in bio, biomedical engineering. So he's a, not just an, an, an anesthesiologist doing an clinical work, but he's an innovator. And uh, he have a, a, a very good uh, and a very long uh, experience in biomedical engineering. And he's certified from uh, University of Toronto. He received his Canadian Board of Certification in Anesthesia in 1986. This is before I just uh, go to uh, high school. Uh, both from University of, Tele of Toronto also, an American certification in 1989 for anesthesia. Dr. Doyle has a long-standing interest in ENT and difficult airway management as well as interest in the use of technology in medicine and th this uh, presentation today about the technology in medicine. <laughs> he is a past president of both the Society of Airway Management and Society of Technology in Anesthesia. His recent book, uh, um, co-editor, with Dr. Basim Abdel, uh, Abdel Malik is entitled Anesthesia for Otolaryngoscopic Surgery and is published uh, uh, 2012. And another book also entitled Clinical Airway Management and Illustrated Case Piece uh, uh, Approach. Uh, that was published in Cambridge University Press in 2017. And uh, uh, you know that when I just go for short CV or short paragraph for Dr. Doyle, there is not, nothing short with Prof. Doyle. So I just uh, will stop here. And uh, my our objective of the presentation today is about uh, <coughs> so, uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you have anything to ask about or just to, to uh, 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 any concern about the presentation, because really I'm interested in this uh, topic also, and I'm happy to be here. And the objective uh, to introduce the audience basic principle of artificial intelligence 
machine learning and how this technology be are being applied in the field of medicine and we are the most we have the most professional to uh, get us in simple way and to explore the potential benefits of artificial intelligence in medicine such as improving diagnostic accuracy prediction uh, patient outcome and then they identify effectiveness effective treatment again to discuss some of the challenge and limitation of using artificial intelligence because mostly we don't trust the machine all the time um, uh, including concern around privacy, bias, and ethical consideration, and also to share real-world example of how artificial intelligence is currently being used in healthcare, such as radiology, drug discovery, and also ultrasound, uh, even uh, general anesthesia. And also at the end to this, uh, to encourage discussion and dialogue around the potential potential impact of artificial intelligence in medicine and what steps can be taken to ensure that this technology are used in a responsible and ethical way without any more adding problem. And the field for you, for um, CETA, for you, Prof. Doyle, um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see the screen well. I have no conflicts of interest to, to declare and the topic medical artificial intelligence exploring the realm. So in the top right, it says no conflicts of interest to declare, but I have an additional declaration and that is that this material has been prepared with artificial intelligence assistant using chat GPT. This is a lot of material, and if you want a copy of these slides, please write me at djdoyle at hotmail.com, and I'd be glad to send them to you, as you may want to use this for your own teaching. Uh, the outline here on the left is our talk outline. We're going to talk about some applications of artificial intelligence, such as early warning systems to give a clinical basis for it, talk about the Turing test and Alan Turing, one of the founders of artificial intelligence, look at the types of artificial intelligence, rule-based, map-based machine learning, and also talk about chat GPT, which um, since November has stirred an interest around the world. On the right, you can see some of the medical applications I'd like to talk about, such as acid-based interpretation, early warning systems, and some other things I'll be taking a look at, such as chest X-ray and CT scan interpretation, as well as robotics, antibiotic choice, and many other things. So let's get started. Artificial intelligence has rapidly changed the way we live and work in the 21st century, and there's been remarkable progress. The integration of artificial intelligence into medicine has enormous potential to improve patient outcomes, improve efficiency in the healthcare system. Indeed, we, we see artificial intelligence every day with smartphones, smart air conditioners, cybersecurity that's fighting disinformation to help with machine translation, cars that drive themselves, online suggestions uh, for shopping. It never ends. Self-driving cars are now a reality and um, are uh, present in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, surgical robots, you've probably been familiar with them for some time, for robotic surgery. We see this a lot in the operating room. And uh, in the everyday world, the Apple Watch has um, a number of artificial intelligence applications that you can see on the right. On the left, you can see that this watch says that the uh, heart rate is 76 uh, beats per minute and the patient to sinus rhythm does not show signs of atrial fibrillation. There's a variety of Apple Watch models that have various uh, sensors that can be useful clinically. Uh, some of them have electrocardiographic uh, um, support, uh, optical heart rate sensors, and so on. And we'll take a look at some of this in a minute. For example, here is a heart rate notification. It says your heart rate rose above 120 while you seemed inactive for 10 minutes starting at 9.59 a.m. So uh, this might be the onset of atrial fibrillation or some other problem. Uh, and it gives you a warning and get an electrocardiogram to figure out what's happening. Here, the watch says possible atrial fibrillation. This result is not a diagnosis of possible finding, and they recommend a full electrocardiogram. And in fact, you can do ECG on the Apple Watch as shown here. Details are present on the left. But in a clinical study, using 12-lead electrocardiographic recording as a reference device, the ECG app demonstrated 99.3 specificity in classifying sinus rhythm and 98.5 sensitivity in classifying atrial fib. So not bad. 
Uh, and this is just the start of things. Another thing is fall detection. It can detect if you have uh, fallen down and you can even send an emergency alert. This can be helpful for the elderly who have reduced, reduced mobility. Uh, one of the things that you can see is that you can hook onto your Apple Watch. Uh, on the left, you can see left bottom, uh, a QR code where you can go to get information. On the right, we can see that you can put information uh, just um, in ordinary English on a little sticker that will go on the side of your watch for people who are uh, medically fragile. So uh, medical ID allows first responders and emergency room clinicians to access information from a patient's uh, iPhone uh, or Apple Watch without requiring a password and compromising patient privacy. So this is another feature. Medications, it can tell you when to take your medications. And here you can record the electrocardiogram at will. Um, here on the left, we see an example of a glucose monitor sensor that transmits the information to your Apple Watch and shows you the milligrams per deciliter. So you don't need to take blood sugar uh, values uh, with a stick except to do calibration of this device. So here's an example of some of the many, many artificial intelligence applications. We've seen autonomous driving. We're going to learn about machine learning and deep learning neural networks, but only briefly, uh, just to get you interested. Uh, so there's many things that we're going to have a chance to take a look at. And most of these will be medical uh, AI applications, medical imaging, diagnosis, treatment. For example, AI algorithms can help diagnose medical images, and we'll see examples of this in a moment. In fact, there's a number of startups. Here's over 100 uh, companies that have started up with a view to transforming healthcare with artificial intelligence. So it's really, really taking off. But let's go back to the beginning. This is Alan Turing, who in 1950 wrote a famous article uh, called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And a new form of problem can be described in terms of a game we call the imitation game, where you have a person who is interacting with a machine and trying to find out, is it a person or is it a machine? Uh, so we'll see some examples of this. And uh, here is the first beginning of this famous article. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? This should begin with definitions of the meaning of the terms machine and think. And he goes on and on. And this, of course, is the subject of a lot of philosophical discourse, even to this day. He described what was called a Turing machine, a mathematical model of computation describing an abstract machine that manipulates symbols on a strip of tape, according to a set of rules. And despite this simplicity, it's capable of implementing any computer algorithm. Now, some of you may remember that there was a nice movie called The Imitation Game that tells us about the story of Alan Turing, and I'd recommend that you see it. It's a brilliant movie, and I think you'd, you'd enjoy it, particularly with the background I'm able to present. Well, the Turing test is, can a machine appear to be as intelligent uh, in conversation as a normal person? And uh, here's something from the internet. It says, Google's AI passed a famous test and showed how the test is broken. The idea is that now we've got artificial intelligence that clearly passes the Turing test and clearly pass for a human. Uh, and I'll show some examples of that in a while. Uh, this started uh, with Turing, of course. In 1965, a guy uh, came up with a program called ELISA, which would simply repeat what you're saying in different words to be what we would call a Rogerian psychotherapist. So ELISA says, please tell me what's been bothering you. And you say the weather is awful. Eliza says, I'm not sure I understand you fully. You reply, I hate the current weather. And it goes on. And all this Eliza does is recast what you say in a way that makes you talk some more. But now it's come a long way. In 2011, uh, Watson, a natural language question answering computer created by IBM, defeated two former Jeopardy champions. This is a quiz show uh, where people uh, answer obscure things. Uh, and Watson beat these two champions. Now we have a new thing, ChatGDP, uh, which I'm going to introduce you to. It immediately started a new age of artificial intelligence. And uh, a good way to begin all of this is that all artificial intelligence begins on some form of knowledge representation. So let's talk about how we might represent knowledge. 
It can be in the form of rules, of maps, flowchart, software code, algorithms, and some other techniques that are shown here, such as semantic networks. And I'll show you some of this. But the rule-based approach to medical AI uh, is best illustrated with three diagnostic examples. So rule number one is if the patient, the patient is diabetic, if their H, uh, hemoglobin A1C is 6.5 or above. And this comes as a definition from the American uh, Diabetes Association and other uh, agencies of interest. Another rule, a first degree electrocardiogram block. A first degree block is present if the PR interval in the electrocardiogram exceeds 200 milliseconds. And third, patient is obese if their BMI is 30 or above. So these are three diagnostic examples that everyone can understand. Uh, another way of representing medical knowledge is called semantic networks. Uh, and here you can see on the bottom, uh, a mammal has a vertebra, a cat has fur, bears have fur, uh, a cat and a bear are both mammals. And uh, this is a way of representing knowledge that we'll see later on in an anesthesia representation with one of the early pioneers in anesthesia on AI, uh, Professor Miller. Uh, so what are semantic networks? Well, I asked chat GPT uh, because uh, you can ask this artificial intelligence to comment on things and it will answer you. And so it says that a semantic network is a form of knowledge representation that organizes information in graph-like structures with concepts represented as nodes and the relationships between these concepts represented as links. And they give an example below. Now, what's interesting is that uh, I asked chat GPT to uh, provide this information and I edited it slightly to uh, make it fit in this slide, but this is highly intelligent and it shows you that it passes the Turing test of appearing to be quite intelligent. Uh, well, let's take an example of some rule-based AI that's uh, clinically useful to this day, and that's clinical early warning systems. Uh, AI algorithms can be used to monitor patients, calculate drug doses, or provide early warning systems. And let's see, see this example of rule-based AI. Uh, clinical early warning systems identify patients who are at risk of deteriorating and provides early warning of potential adverse events. Uh, very common step-down units and intensive care units, particularly in the United Kingdom where they seem to have originated. Uh, so here's an article if you want more information on it, uh, how AI supports prognosis related applications in the form of clinical early warning systems. So here are some things that you can enter into the early warning system, pulse, temperature, systolic pressure, respiratory rate, conscious level, consciousness level, oxygen saturation, and the use of supplemental oxygen. And these are things that are readily uh, found out on the ward. And you can display this various kinds of information on a display like this, taking a look at various parameters for various patients. Uh, so it typically uses a combination of physiological parameters like the ones I showed you, heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation. And the score is used to prioritize patients for intervention and prompt clinical review. The goal is to identify patients who are at risk of worsening before they become critically ill so that prompt interventions can be made to prevent further deterioration. And you can even have a text message, an SMS message be sent to ensure the problem does not get overlooked. And hopefully this leads to improved patient outcomes, reduced mortality, morbidity, and reduced healthcare costs. It can also be integrated with electronic health records so that information is automatically introduced. So here are, for example, some of the common parameters that I just mentioned that are used in early warning systems. The uh, uh, NHS has the NHS early warning system. And you can see if, for example, if the pulse rate is between 41 and 50, then you get a one in the warning system. If it's less than 40, you get a three. Temperature under 35, you get a three. Systolic pressure over uh, 220, you get a three and so on. And then uh, here we can focus in on this, but these are things that are uh, easily obtained clinically. None of them are exotic. Uh, and then it comes up with a rule. Uh, here is the modified early warning system and we can focus in on it, respiratory rate, heart rate, systolic pressure, consciousness level, and so on. And on the bottom, you can see what to do for various kinds of scores. So if the patient has a score of one to two, you do, uh, two hourly observations inform the nurse in charge. If it's uh, three, one uh, to two hourly observations. If it's four or more, 
observations at least one half hourly and ensure medical advice is sought and contact the outreach team. So this is another version of an early warning system. And here's one for pediatrics. And you can see, again, they have various suggestions. If the score is over four, uh, increase the frequency to one per hour, uh, uh, one per every four hours. If it's over eight, contact the attending physician within 10 minutes or call the emergency team. So this is an example of artificial intelligence uh, with a clinical application. Let's take a look at some of the various approaches to medical artificial intelligence. We have rule-based approaches, map-based approaches, flowchart-based approaches, and, and others. Uh, the rule-based approach we've already had some exposure to. Uh, here they are again, if the patient's diabetic, if their uh, hemoglobin A1C is 6.5 or more, the ECG heart block, first degree heart block, if it's PR interval over 200 milliseconds, BMI over 30 means you're obese. These are simple rules. Here is a rule in uh, that's more complicated that it applies in microbiology. If the gram stain is gram positive and the morphology is caucus and the conformation is changed, then the uh, organism is probably streptococcus. So this is an example that can be useful in microbiology. This is in the form of what we call an if-then-else statement. Uh, and we'll have a look at this, but basically it's a basic, basic form of representation in uh, computer uh, language. Here is an example of the if-then-else type of statement in a computer language. This is for the Arduino microcontroller, but it just shows you how it's used. And so if we have the medical, I uh, should say the modified early warning system I mentioned earlier, we have the if-then formation. If the early warning score is two or less, then observe every two hours. If it's three, observe every one to two hours. If it's four or more, observe the patient every 30 minutes. So this is the example of the if-then-else statement. Now, there's another way of doing this, and that is uh, classification via a map-based approach. Here we show the Forrester heart failure classification, taking a look at cardiac index and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and they divide them into four subsets. So there's a map, a two-dimensional map, cardiac index versus pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And you can see it can divide the classification into four categories. And ordinarily you'd want the patient in to be in subset one, good ventricular uh, performance with a good cardiac index and not a high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Here, you can use a map-based approach for medical artificial intelligence uh, for uh, arterial blood gas analysis, taking a look on the uh, vertical axis of bicarb and on the right, arterial pH or arterial hydrogen ion concentration. And you can see it's mapped into various diagnoses, such as normal acute respiratory acidosis, chronic respiratory acidosis, and so on. And in fact, another way of doing this is to do a flow chart. And here is a flow chart that exists where you start and you look at the pH. If the pH is under 7.35, then you go on the right as shown up here. If it's less than 7.35, uh, you go here. If it's uh, more than 7.35, you go down this way. And you have various diagnoses shown on the right. And we'll just focus in on this a bit. You start here and you work your way through this flow chart. And eventually you get a variety of diagnoses such as uncompensated respiratory acidosis, uncompensated metabolic acidosis, and so on. And you can see this, this fits into if statements. For example, if the pH is less than 7.35 and the PCO2 is greater than 45 and the bicarb is under 22, then you have combined acidosis and so on. So these are some examples. Let's take a look now at what artificial intelligence is and it's many, many forms. And there's many forms of artificial intelligence. They're not all the same. Uh, the expert systems that we've taken a look at for blood gas analysis, for example, is very different from the use of AI in robotics or natural language processing. So a variety of uh, authorities will define it in various ways in terms of machine learning, speech understanding, vision recognition, uh, useful in personal identification, for example, and expert systems or robotics. Here is another. Uh, explanation of how artificial intelligence feeds into speech recognition, planning, robotics, vision, uh, natural language processing, and so on. Uh, here, they say that 
two important subsets of artificial intelligence are machine learning and a subset of machine learning is deep learning. Machine learning has the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning in which artificial neural networks adapt and learn from vast amounts of data. And we'll be talking about that in a little while. Uh, there are many kinds of uh, artificial intelligence uh, and people are working on various kinds. Uh, narrow artificial intelligence, for example, uh, might in, be involved in narrow applications such as blood gas interpretation, and some are more general, as we'll see in a minute. So some are purely reactive. It does not um, it take uh, stock of memories. Some have limited memory. And then there's consideration that maybe some forms of artificial intelligence uh, are aware of their internal states. And that's a controversy, whether or not we can ever make a sentient self-aware system. Now, one question in medical AI is rule-based AI better or worse or different from machine learning? Which works best for medical AI? And it turns out it depends on the application. So uh, here we say that there are uh, two techniques that I'll mention briefly, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And we'll take a look at this in more detail. Uh, supervised learning can be divided into regression classification, unsupervised learning into clustering. Uh, so within machine learning, there's two basic approaches, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And the difference is that supervised learning uses label data to help predict outcomes, while unsupervised learning does not. So label data might be you have, for example, some uh, uh, CT scans, and you know what the diagnosis is. For example, it might be a pulmonary nodule, uh, and you take all of these uh, CT scans and you put a label on them, pulmonary nodule and non-pulmonary module, and then it goes and diagnoses future uh, CT scans. So this is supervised learning. Uh, here is an example. You put input data in it of images and you tell the computer that these are apples and it develops a model so that it predicts that it's an apple when it sees a future image. So here's how supervised learning works. Provide the machine learning algorithm with labeled input here we have an example of pictures of cats, and you show hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of pictures of cats into the machine, and eventually it learns because it's labeled as cats. And then you feed the machine new unlabeled information to see if it tags the new data appropriately, and if not, it does corrections. So it divides new images into cats and not cats. And then uh, it's useful for classification or regression, identifying uh, the items into various categories, cats versus non-cats, for example. Now, this is distinct from unsupervised learning where we have input data and we don't know what these are and we actually develop a computer model to sort them into apples, peaches, bananas, and so on in this particular example. Here, you start with a whole pile of images. These would be dogs and cats. And it establishes similar group without our training, um, and this would be cats on the top and dogs on the group on the bottom by virtue of their similarity. And this is suitable for clustering and for anomaly detection. Okay, so these are just examples of some of the techniques. Uh, there are many other techniques, clustering algorithms, um, early detection techniques, decision tree algorithms that I already expose you to uh, with the blood gas example, and there's many others. But among the most popular of these, especially in radiology, is the neural network approach, where you have an input uh, set of images that goes to an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. And these are artificial neurons that are connected to each other and connected to the input and output data. An example would be for anesthesia, you have an input layer might be the uh, power in the EEG, the entropy in the EEG, the mean arterial pressure, heart rate variability, and the output layer uh, says the patient's either awake or the patient's asleep, processed in this way. Now, I want to introduce you to chat GPT because it's one of the most interesting applications of artificial intelligence. You can download it uh, on your computer uh, very easily by signing up. And I asked chat GPT to tell me what kind of things that AI can do in anesthesia. And this is its answer. 
says it can be useful in predictive modeling, real-time modeling, sedation depth monitoring, prediction of post-operative pain, assistance with difficult airway management, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not my writing. This is the stuff that we got from chat GPT itself. Uh, so here's an example of some of the things I asked it. I said, please explain the precautions that anesthesiologists must take to reduce the risk of gastric aspiration following reduction of general anesthesia in the patient with incomplete gastric emptying. So this is like an oral exam question you would ask one of your uh, students. Uh, and here's the AI response. It's very detailed, uh, not bad at all, including the use of prokinetic agents. Again, this is everything it said. It's not what I put up. Uh, it came up with it on its own. Uh, but it's interesting because uh, some of the things it says are a little strange. Uh, positioning, patients should be placed in the left lateral decubitus position to help the re reduce the risk of gas pressure. I don't think so. Uh, and there's no mention of rapid sequence inductions and cricoid pressure, no mention of awake intubation. So as interesting as this is, it's not hard to find that there are problems with some of the responses provided. Here's question number two. Discuss the potential implications and contraindications pertaining to awake fiber optic intubation in patient with suspected difficult airway. So uh, here it provides a whole pile of information, indications uh, shown here and contraindications shown. Uh, and it provides some obvious things. Uh, awake fiber optic uh, intubation contraindication with patients with severe bleeding and coagulopathies as bleeding during the procedure make visualization of the vocal cords difficult, increase the risk of complications. But in fact, um, it doesn't specify that that's really the problem if there's bleeding in the airway. It's not a problem if you're bleeding, for example, in the abdomen. So some of the responses need a little clarification. What about the parturient in need of emergency section for profound fetal bradycardia? Well, here's what it says here. And here's some interesting things. Anesthetic techniques that allow rapid awakening early extubation, such as regional anesthesia, may be preferred. And this goes against what we're usually taught about the need for uh, instantly inducing uh, general anesthesia in the parturient who uh, has fetal distress. Uh, so it mentions that there's a need for rapid uh, sequence induction may be necessary. Uh, so overall, it provides a lot of useful information, but some of it's a little strange. Here I asked Chat uh, GPT to give me an examination in anesthesia, so multiple choice questions. These it came up with on its own. What is the main purpose of general anesthesia? Answer B, to induce unconsciousness. What are the common methods of uh, administering general anesthesia? A and B, inhalation and intravenous, and so on. So it can come up with the multiple choice exam questions. Uh, here's some more. What's the most commonly used device for tracheal intubation? Answer, endotracheal tube. Um, so it comes up with some useful stuff. Here's some more. Potential complications of tracheal intubation, all of the above. What is the most uh, important factor when considering uh, performing tracheal intubation? All of the above. So all overall, these are not bad for starting, but you'll want to edit these if you're going to use them. So. When I was preparing this lecture, I thought, what does chat GPT, uh, what can it help me with? It says, please give me an outline for a lecture on artificial intelligence and medicine with emphasis on its application to anesthesia, surgery, and ICU care. And I asked chat GPT uh, to tell me about this. And it said, well, here's an outline, uh, AI in anesthesia, AI in surgery, AI in ICU care, clinical support systems, and some of the challenges. And so here's uh, the first outline that it offered and not a bad starting point. Uh, so that's chat GPT. I'm gonna get back to chat GPT later to show you some of the considerations that we have to take into account because they don't always provide useful information. But so what are some of the applications of AI in healthcare? Uh, Chatbots we already got introduced to, the treatment design, mining medical records, virtual healthcare assistance are all possibilities. Um, here is an article that I contributed to uh, called Artificial Intelligence, the New Alexander Fleming, talking about AI applications in infectious disease management. Uh, here we have a company uh, that is aiming to tackle drug-resistant pathogens through artificial intelligence. The, they've developed a platform called uh, Ampli, 
which connects the digital biological biome to high volume peptide and protein extraction technology to unlock a new frontier in drug discovery. It uses black box unpublished machine learning and bioinformatic methodologies to highlight novel compounds using a complex web of over 450 metadata tags. So the idea is that it's coming up with new molecules that may be useful. Let's take a look at AI in radiology because this is one of the uh, most interesting applications. And one of the companies in Japan who's working on this is called uh, InfraVision. Uh, they call it an extra pair of eyes for radiologists. With AI, we improve human life. So one of their versions is uh, a program called uh, DR chest. It detects 20 plus chest lesions from conventional x-ray scans, including lung nodules, fractures, pneumothoraces, pleural effusions, and so on. And here you can see an x-ray and it says, I see some pathology here. I see three fractures. And here they are, uh, fractures one, two, and three in the ribs, all identified for you. So it makes it a little bit easier for you to find things. Another thing it offers is a CT scan uh, algorithm for lung cancer screening. It automatically identifies different types of lung nodules, solid calcified uh, ground glass nodules in a lung CT scan. So here is a lung CT scan. And on the right here, you can see the lung nodule screening report. So here is the nodule right there. So it's another software. Uh, and then it detects four different conditions from a single CT scan, and that's lung nodules, chest fractures, bone metastases, bone tumors, and chronic lung disease. Another thing it can assist with is stroke detection via CT scan. Uh, you have a patient who gets a stroke, you uh, immediately get a CT scan with a view to trying to do some endovascular procedures for this, and it will identify whether there's a stroke present or not. In fact, here is another application of AI uh, for lung CT scans to help diagnose COVID-19 that comes out of China. So this is happening around the world. Here's another interesting application. This is a radiological application that identifies a particular kind of pacemaker on radiological grounds. So rather than interrogate it, uh, which is the usual way of doing it, if there's no uh, machine available or the interrogator doesn't recognize the unit, X-rays may be helpful. So this is another example of artificial intelligence. Identifies the make and model of cardiac rhythm devices, such as pacemakers and AICDs. Software can detect over 1,600 different types of cardiac devices based on the chest X-ray. Uh, and software outperformed traditional pacemaker identification methods. Well, let's focus in on anesthesia. Uh, we have anesthesia in the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative settings many different applications, uh, including fluid management, pain management, risk assessment, and so on. Uh, the interest in AI in anesthesia goes back many years. Here's 1983, so we're talking 40 years now, where Miller, Perry Miller, developed a technique uh, for critiquing anesthetic management. He called it the attending computer system. And here's the article on the left from anesthesiology. And on the right, you can see that there is a semantic network that can be used to represent knowledge. So uh, this was an augmented decision network that was used for this. And you can see that he used the semantic network knowledge representation approach as shown here. Now we have other applications of anesthesia such as closed loop anesthesia where we have, for example, a patient electroencephalogram is used to determine the depth of anesthesia. And then we have software that controls an infusion pump under computer control. So the idea is that when the uh, BIS recording for the uh, electroencephalogram, when the bispectral index is too high, typically over 60, then it will increase the propofol infusion to lower it again. Um, here, is machine learning prediction of post-operative emergency department hospital readmission based on some 34,000 surgical hospital admissions. And the idea is that it predicts hospital-specific models uh, about who's going to be admitted into the hospital following their admission to hospital for surgery. And so 
uh, here's the prediction of your admission and the uh, uh, performance of this is moderate, the area under the curve 0. 0.74 to 0. 0.76. This is uh, the area under the curve is a metric of performance for to see how well these AI systems work. Uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, AI and uh, artificial intelligence for uh, airway management, here is the Intubot. It is an intubation robot, uh, enables precise maneuvering and harmful uh, avoids harmful tissue contact, freeing up one hand because of automated insertion. So uh, this is the robotic aspect of artificial intelligence that people are working on. Now, what about the intensive care unit? Uh, well, here is a review article. Um, uh, again, this is from Perry Miller. You can see him on the right. Uh, as early as 1988, people have been working on artificial intelligence and anesthesia in the OR and ICU. Here are some additional articles that you might be interested in if you want additional materials, but you can see uh, that there's a lot going on. What about predictive models? This can be very useful in planning. And two clinical examples where AI-based predictive models help in ICU decision making are sepsis and mechanical ventilation. So let's take a look at them. For sepsis, here is uh, an article where they uh, developed an algorithm with independent clinical notes and achieved a high predictive accuracy uh, 12 hours before the onset of sepsis, area under the curve 0.94. Now, I mentioned area under the curve, the uh, higher the number, the better the performance. And so this is spectacularly excellent. Uh, antibiotics, I've already made mention that uh, it can be useful for AI chosen antibiotics. Uh, here for uh, AI in mechanical ventilation is an article, Artificial Intelligence for Mechanical Ventilation, Systemic Review of Design, Reporting Standards, and Bias. So the authors here started with uh, 1,342 studies concerning mechanical ventilation. 95 were ultimately selected for their high quality designs. They made recommendations to emphasize the validation of the algorithms used in medical AI. What about medical diagnosis? Well, uh, here in this journal article from 2019, they are uh, talking about the use of AI in diagnostic radiology, dermatology, pathology, and ophthalmology. Here, predicting the outcome of sepsis. Uh, and so we have just so many applications and so uh, many uses uh, that it raised some interesting questions. And that is, these machines are so smart, could they actually be conscious? Could they be sentient? So that's a question of philosophy that uh, we don't have an answer to. Uh, but uh, here is another article from Science, Conscious Machines, uh, defining the questions. They certainly are so smart. Could they be conscious? But there's a problem, and it's called the other mind problem. Mental states are privileged and cannot be directly shared from one person to another. Uh, not directly. You has to be in, indirectly through speech, for example. Consequently, one cannot be philosophically certain that other beings are actually sentient as opposed to just behaving that way. So that's a philosophical issue. Now let's go back to uh, our AI in medicine. Some future AI platform ideas uh, suggest lower cost medications that may be just as effective as some more expensive patented medications, offer multimodal pain management strategies that employ opioids conservatively and adhere to published pain management algorithms, offer insulation, uh, insulin administration strategies to uh, recommended diabetes uh, management and so on, uh, offer diagnostic headaches separating routine benign tension headaches from uh, headaches requiring immediate attention, such as those caused by intracerebral bleeds. Okay, well, here's a test case. Uh, I want to know whether chat uh, GPT operates as a, a, a diagnostician. So I asked, it, I asked it this question. I said, my patient has a new onset of chest pain, which he describes as sharp and worse during inspiration. Uh, so I would want to make it so that it doesn't sound cardiac. This sounds more like it might be pulmonary. Any ideas about diagnosis and some helpful tests? And let's see what it said. It said chest pain can be a symptom of several conditions. Could be pneumonia, could be pulmonary embolism, could be pleurisy. Uh, so it gave me some suggestions and here is uh, the answer that it provided for a workup. 
uh, blood tests, chest x-ray, electrocardiogram, computer tomography, look for signs of pulmonary embolism, and even a D-dimer blood test to detect the presence of a substance in the blood that may indicate a pulmonary embolism. So good starting point. It may make you think of things that you may not have thought of, for example, pulmonary embolus. Uh, so another question I asked it is, what are the considerations for a parturient undergoing emergency cesarean section? And I already mentioned, mentioned to this earlier, and look at the considerations that it, that it indicated. Uh, this is very detailed. Um, what's interesting is that uh, chat GPT sometimes seems to be intelligent in the sense that it offers apologies. So here is a computer question I asked it because I play with computers a lot. What Arduino microcontroller is a pin layout and spacing of the Arduino Uno, but it's much more powerful. And it gave me this answer and it turned out this answer was not really satisfactory. Uh, so uh, I asked it again, and it said, I apologize for the mistake in my previous answer. There is an Arduino microcontroller that's the exact same pinout, et cetera. So it will go and apologize and, and change its answers from time to time. So it raises the question, is medical AI actually trustworthy? Well, here's another example here on the is an illustration of how the trachea is normally sits over or anterior to the esophagus. We're already familiar with this. And I asked it to discuss the uh, relative position of the trachea and the esophagus uh, when cricoid pressure is used. And here's what it said. In general, the esophagus lies posterior to the trachea and separated by the vertebral column. I'm thinking, no, that's not the case. In the esophagus posterior uh, position anteriorly relative to the trachea, cricoid pressure may be less effective in preventing regurgitation. Well, the esophagus is never positioned anteriorly to the trachea. So this is a bit confusing. And what's interesting is you can tell it that it's wrong and it will apologize. So here, in general, the esophagus lies posterior to the trachea and is separated by, by the vertical column. Well, no, that's not the case. Wrong. So chat GPT is like a genius friend who's super happy to help you, happy to answer any question you might have, almost any topic you might think of. From summarizing Plato's allegory of the cave to helping you out in writing a computer program for your Arduino, chat GPT is there to assist you instantly and at no cost if you want. You can subscribe to it, of course, but it's free if you want. Chat GPT is an astonishingly intellect it's wonderfully polite. There's nothing it can't comment on intelligently, eloquently, and with grace. But there's a problem. Your genius friend is not fully trustworthy. Sometimes he remembers things that are wrong. Sometimes he provides incorrect information, kind of like an honor student taking an oral exam who just misses getting an A in his assigned exam grade because while he did a pretty good job in answering, there were some misunderstandings that became apparent during the discussion. So here's some examples of this. I asked about gastric pull-up surgery. And it says, in this procedure, the stomach is moved up into the chest to replace the esophagus, and the esophagus is reconnected to the stomach. Well, the esophagus can't be reconnected to the stomach if it's removed. What about ECG interpretation? Here is an article from Anesthesiology News just from last month. And an abnormal ECG interpreted by the computer system is atrial fibrillation. But if you look at it, it said, well, that's not atrial fibrillation. And in fact, the ECG is interpreted as atrial fibrillation. But in fact, the computer interpretation was wrong. The ECG actually showed nodal bradycardia consistent with the vasovagal response, not atrial fibrillation. Okay, so we want to read more about that misinterpretation of computerized ECG machines, a case report, and literature review. That's why some sort of computer uh, interpretation needs to be backed up by computers, uh, by people in the end. So there's challenges and limitations to medical AI. Lack of standardization exists in data collection, need for large amounts of data, ethical considerations need to be considered, such as data privacy and security. So I'd like to close by commenting on some of the artificial intelligence dangers to humanity that people are concerned, because it can be used by governments to harm their citizens. 
uh, by facial recognition, speaker identification, warfare robots, surveillance drones, and the management of social credit. And I'll let you uh, read about these uh, in a separate matter. But when I asked ChatGPT, what are the risks to humanity posed by unregulated AI? It actually came up with a fairly good series of things that uh, are worthy of our consideration, such as job displacement uh, and bias and discrimination. Okay. Uh, is using chat GPT a form of plagiarism? Well, that's an interesting question. To generate content with chat GPT would be a form of plagiarism if the content is presented as one's original work without prior uh, attribution. So more and more people are using chat GPT to generate talks and stuff as I, as I am. And you can see that uh, you have to explain where your source comes from. So in conclusion, while AI has the potential to transform medicine and improve patient outcomes, it remains important to carefully address the challenges and limitations. As AI continues to evolve, it's likely that it'll become an increasingly important tool in the healthcare system, enable us, us to deliver care to patients. A final note, our focus must be to solve clinical problems and not merely throw technology as patients. I'd like to though add a postscript because we have a new development that has just become available. And that is the idea of making human brain tissue grown in a Petri dish as a neural network that can also solve clinical and mathematical problems. So they're called brain organoids. organoids. It's a miniaturized and simplified version of an organ produced in vitro in three dimensions that mimics the key structural, functional, and biological complexity of that organ. So you could draw, you could, for example, grow a tissue culture of uh, kidney tissue. And if it's done right, it could be used as a replacement for dialysis. At least that's one of the hopes. These are derived from one or a few cells from tissue embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, which self-organize into three-dimensional structure. Then they're doing this for brains. Uh, and the idea is that we have neural tissue, typically uh, from human tissue, human brain tissue, and it's organized into a three-dimensional structure. So here's an article. It's uh, just from February 27th of this year, Organized Intelligence, the New Frontier in Biocomputing and intelligence on a dish. They write, we envision, envision complex inter, um, uh, networked interfaces where brain organize are connected with real-time sensors and output devices and ultimately with each other and with sensory organ organoids like for example, retinal organoids and are trained using biofeedback, big data warehousing and machine learning methods. So this is a new dimension. It's just been mentioned in the, uh, from uh, basically, uh, uh, one to two weeks ago as a new technology being introduced in biocomputing. And here are the key points that they make for people who want more details about the concept of biocomputing and intelligence in a dish. Here are various trajectories that they see for how this technology will be introduced. And this brings us to sort of where we were in the computers in the 1950s here we are with this whole new technology just been introduced basically two weeks ago that you're going to find interesting in our, especially in our children's and grandchildren's careers. One question is, is it ethical to grow a brain in a Petri dish? I'll let you read about that if you're interested. And with that, I'd like to bring the talk to an end and thank everyone for their attention. Very much appreciate it. Thank you both uh, Doyle and I think it is a raw material for a discussion and um, uh, first I think um, I let uh, our professor Dr. Dawlatli have uh, some concern and question you can um, uh, ask Dr. Dawlatli I just can open the uh, sorry the mic for you Dr. Dawlatli. Okay thank you very much uh, Professor Doyle for this interesting uh, presentation on AI Actually, one point I wanted to mention, because we are receiving articles um, basically written through either the chat GPT or any other platforms 
similar to it. And when we check the similarity index, it came, as you mentioned in your last slide, with plagiarism, um, very high percentage. And article, um, ultimately, is going to be rejected. My question is, uh, whom to blame now? The researcher or the chat GPT? Well, it's not a question of a blame so much as a paradigm shift in the way things are done. Uh, chat GPT can be very useful uh, at the early planning stages of writing an article, uh, but you have to edit the material appropriately so that it's actually yours and not belong to chat GPT. I think it would be helpful as I did at the very beginning to indicate at the top that you use chat GPT, chat GPT in uh, the development of this, just like you would use a research assistant uh, if you are a professor. Many professors have research assistants and graduate assistants, and they use them to collect references, for example, collect materials uh, and summarize them. Chat GPT can do the same thing. Uh, and so the, the question is, what kind of statement should you provide to let people know that ChatGPT was used, just like you might provide recognition that you had a research assistant who is very helpful in providing discussions. Uh, this will evolve and eventually journals will provide guidelines for this. Uh, there's also going to be detectors that will detect plagiarism. And there's many plagiarism detecting software out there. And you can take your manuscripts and have them scanned to make sure that there's no inadvertent plagiarism. Uh, when I've done that myself and found that there was plagiarism detected, often it was because I had the same quotes as somebody else. So I'll, for example, quote an article uh, um, and the plagiarism detector will say, well, this quote was provided elsewhere. And yes, because that's a quotation. So this is a, a new thing. It's going to be especially important when we talk about students writing essays. Uh, you, uh, in, uh, yeah, in studying yeah. history, for example, uh, you're going to write essays on various topics, and you want to make sure that plagiarism is not present. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, another question. I have a question, but I will be at the end. But uh, now. I think Dr. Ahmed uh, asking another question. You can uh, discuss Dr. Ahmed as well as Dr. Open your uh, mic. Open your mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Thanks for the presentation, uh, Dr. Doyle. Um, my question is about however artificial intelligence represents a breakthrough, such as picking up patient data from a uh, watch, uh, such as the Apple Watch, but using personalized patient data, such as their medical registration number, represents a compromise and a breach of their confidentiality. Do we need to modify patient consents to avoid any breach in general data protection regulations? Um, good question. And that may depend on what the laws are for your particular environment. So the laws in Europe and the laws in the United States, uh, not only are they in evolution, but they may be different. Uh, so this is a regulatory issue, and no doubt there are committees whose job it is to sort this through. So I don't have a good answer for that, except stay tuned. Sure. And my second part also is about the academic writing, as mentioned by Dr. Al Daulatli, uh, but uh, using the AI, AI programs such as ChatGPT represents a compromise for the ethics of research. How can we overcome that? Apart well, from mentioning that we have used the chat GPT in the academic writing or something. Yeah. So I think the answer is you have to explain that uh, chat GPT was used and explain why. Um, the key thing is that you are open about it. And I think most people will be comfortable in the future for allowing chat GPT as one of the tools that you use for your research. Yeah. Uh, uh, finish, Dr. Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, another question from our colleague, uh, Dr. Saad Guma. He said, asking, is there is any correlation between simulation and artificial intelligence? Uh, absolutely. Uh, artificial intelligence can be very useful in simulation scenarios. Absolutely. 
Um, uh, last question for me. Uh, in 2003, I just went for training for some of uh, being management. Uh, it wasn't just a gastrian gangl ganglion uh, uh, rhizotomy. And I traveled three years before 2000, and uh, my professor was doing about five cases. And he make a blue types like a GBS for the base of the skull to catch the foramen ovale. And after three years, uh, 2003, I went there. He make a blue type for this artificial intelligence. And it, it, it he did about 12 cases per day. And it was a fantastic thing. But um, when I leave uh, after training, he told me uh, last word when I leave, he told me, please don't trust the machine. It is about 20 years before. Now, can we trust the machine now or still?